And the final member will mention of his cabinet, before we mention a, an interesting appointment, is Kenneth O'Donnell. And he again was the special assistant to the president, and his job title was? Uh, appointment secretary to the president. So he set up the president's day. Okay? Do you think that David Powers was really needed as assistant appointment secretary? No, he was just in the loop. Okay? He was in the loop. Okay? Again, he was a close friend of President Kennedy, but a closer friend and a more personal friend to who? What? Bobby Kennedy. Very good. So, Kenneth O'Donnell, special assistant to the president. He was the appointment secretary to President Kennedy. He was a very close friend of President Kennedy, but a very even closer friend to Robert Kennedy. And he also, like I said, co-authored that book, Johnny, We Hardly Knew You. What do you think that was written? By the way? After his assassination. Yeah. Okay, that brings us to our final appointment, which was an interesting one, that of Attorney General. And what the Attorney General done is, does is he advises the President, or she, on matters of law. So obviously the person that you're going to put in that position is going to be an attorney or a lawyer. The man that the president chose to be his attorney general was his brother Robert. Was his brother Robert. That's that quick. Well, it's a great story. What was Robert's main job prior to being attorney general? Campaign running, yeah, running his brother's campaigns. That's what he did. Now, as Brianna mentioned, Robert had only served briefly as a lawyer prior to his appointment. I mean, he had basically no political experience at all. And so do you think that many people were critical of that choice? You know, they were. Many people were critical. Why in the world would John Kennedy pick his brother who has no political experience? I'm going to give you a little bit of Kennedy wit. Okay, do you see it there? Callie, who has the book Kennedy Witt, when, when the president was confronted about that, what did he say? I see nothing wrong with giving Robert some legal experience as attorney general before he goes out to practice law. Yeah, yeah that's a little bit of wit. I, didn't see, I don't see any problem letting him be the most important lawyer in the world before he goes out and practices on his own. That's typical Kennedy Witt. And so, you know, many people were critical, and the president didn't take the bait much. I mean, he, he had a little sarcasm in him and a little wit. And he used it to his advantage. Now, there were three reasons why he chose his brother. Okay? And these might be t-shirt materials, so if you don't have a t-shirt, you might be thinking about this and see if you can come up with them. Three major reasons why Kennedy chose his brother, despite the fact that he had no experience. Anybody without a t-shirt want to get shocked? How be that shy today? He was his brother. Not exactly. Because he could trust him. He knew he could trust him. Did you have a t-shirt yet? Okay. Because he knew he could trust him. Did he care if he had that much legal knowledge? No. No. He knew he could always trust him. Got two more. <coughs> Hoyt was kind of on it a little bit. Why else would he choose his brother, despite the fact he has no political experience? Do you have a t-shirt? No. Okay. He put a lot of work into helping him campaign. It's a nice thought. <laughs> it's a good aunt, but anyway. Okay, who else didn't have a t-shirt said something? Russell, can you say something? I know. Do you have a t-shirt? No. Okay. Think about that. Think about what you, what'd you say. Well, think about some of you. Got, you're, you're kind of on the right track. His father asked him to. His father didn't ask him to. His father told him to. You got a t-shirt? His father told him to do it. Now, why his father... You want a medium or large? Why his father told him... I'm sorry. Why his father told him to do that may be the third answer. One of the reasons his father told him to do it is because he... I think he was family. But the other reason he told him to do it is because he knew that he could always trust his brother, but why, what might be the third reason why he would want and pressure? He wanted Robert to get into politics. Good guess. He You're there. Two sons that are like really he, like arrogantly, he might have. But there was a specific reason why, and it's going to come about on something we're going to study in a minute called the Bay of Pigs. Anybody ever heard of the Bay of Pigs affair? 
Okay, you will hear about it. Mary, give it a guess. Do you have a t-shirt? But give it a guess. Do you have a t-shirt? No. Okay, give it a guess. Why would you? Okay. I'll just give you, I'll, I'll give you the answer, but I'll do it this way. Okay, I served as principal here for three years. Okay, but back the counselor. I could have gone to the middle school as a counselor or the high school. I really didn't care. Okay? Mr. Smith wanted me to stay in the high school. One reason that probably wouldn't work is because when you have the old principal in with the new principal, it causes some confusion, right? That probably wouldn't be a normal thing. And I understood that, so I was very willing to go to the middle school if that's what they wanted me to do. Okay? Try to be the, you know, you want to be the team player. That's where you should be in life. Mr. Smith wanted me to stay. Despite the fact that I was already the principal, first of all, did he have any paranoia that I wanted his job? No, because I just left it, right? But why would he want me to stay? He could trust me. Now think about it. Okay, Bob, now think about that. Bobby and Jack were probably best friends. That's a good point. He, but Mr. Smith knew he could trust me, right? I, I wouldn't be backstabbing him. Could he go to you with questions? And what would I give him, Mary? What would I give him? Honest advice. Honest advice. I would give him the truth no matter how much it hurt him. Okay? I would always give him an honest answer. So if he comes up to me, Mr. Smith, and he has, and says, what do you think about doing this? And I'd say, I, I said to him, I think that's the dumbest damn thing you could ever do. It's going to cause you this trouble and this trouble and this trouble. I would not do that. Sometimes Mr. Smith listens to me and doesn't do it then and in my opinion saves himself trouble and sometimes he does what I tell him not to do and sometimes it works out where it was no problem he was right and sometimes it works out where I could say I told you so but the three reasons why Bobby Kennedy was chosen number one is the dad pressured dad pressured John Kennedy to put him in there but why did he pressure possibly because it was his brother possibly because they were best friends possibly because he loved his brother but he did it because he knew that John Kennedy, uh, Joe Kennedy knew that John could always trust Bobby. He would never be doing anything to subvert him. And two, he knew that Bobby, despite what he felt emotionally, would always give his brother an honest answer. Would tell him what he thought. Okay, that's important. Now, Bobby Kennedy turned out to be the, his brother's closest advisor. And you'll see that as we go on. And if you look to historians, they will tell you, despite his experience as a lawyer, he was a very forceful and effective attorney general. Once his brother was assassinated, he did work for Lyndon Johnson for a short period of time, but did not like Lyndon Johnson and soon left and ran for the Senate seat in New York. So he was, according to historians, an effective attorney general. And you will not believe the impact he had on his brother during the Cuban Missile Crisis, which will be the next test material, and how he kept his brother out of trouble there. Okay, So very good choice, despite the fact that he had very little, if any, experience as a lawyer. Okay, That is the cabinet that we'll be talking about, and those people will be coming on for quite some time here in our lecture. So let's talk about the Peace Corps. Okay, the Peace Corps. How many of you have heard of the Peace Corps before? Yeah, still exists today. We'll tell you how it got its start. The Peace Corps. One of the first things the President did during his administration, and he did this on March 1st of 1961, one of the first things he did in his administration of significance, which happened on March 1st, 1961, is he announced the formation of an organization called the Peace Corps. He announced the formation of an organization called the Peace Corps. Now, the Peace Corps was a governmental agency, but it was scheduled, when first talked about, to be a temporary agency. In other words, they were going to put this thing out on the table, they were going to evaluate it over a short period of time and decide whether it was just going to be a temporary thing or a long-term thing. It turned out to be pretty long-term, hasn't it? 52 years worth or three. Okay? So on March 1st, 1961, President Kennedy announced publicly the formation of a group called the Peace Corps, which was a temporary government agency. And they were going to evaluate this uh, temporary group, and he was going to 
we recommend to Congress whether it be a temporary or be a long-term or permanent program. Well, we know where it's gone. Well, you had to have somebody to head this up. You have to have somebody to uh, to uh, organize and oversee this. Who does he pick? This will be worth a t-shirt. Who does he pick? No. Close. Closer. Stay on the other side of the family. Brother-in-law, which one? Come on, Shaper, you can do it. Sergeant Shriver. Okay, he picks his brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver. Did, did you say it first? I said it. Shut up. Okay, say, I'd like a large. Okay, everybody said it, but you had a shot there, Shape. I was going for you. So he chose his brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver, husband of Eunice Shriver, Eunice County Shriver, to organize and oversee the Peace Corps. And this was organized really to provide two things to developing nations. What's a developing nation, Lynn? Developing nation. It's kind of self-explanatory, but we'll explain it a little bit more. Would Britain be a developing nation? Would, would uh, an African village in the 1960s be a developing nation? That's a nation that hasn't established itself. They don't have any government. They don't have any semblance of order. Okay, so the Peace Corps was established to provide two things to developing nations. Nations that weren't developed or didn't have a semblance of organization or government or anything. Okay, more primitive, right? Okay, they were going to provide humanitarian aid, which would be what? Well, but what would humanitarian aid be? Giving them food, giving them water, giving them some financing, okay? So they were going to give them humanitarian aid, and they were also going to give them education. So on March 1st, 1961, President Kennedy announced the formation of the Peace Corps, which was a temporary government agency. President Kennedy asked Congress to evaluate this temporary group, and if successful, they would make it a permanent program. He chose his brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver, to organize and oversee the Peace Corps, and the Peace Corps was established to provide two things to developing nations, humanitarian aid and education. Okay? We'll tell you how it worked out, how it got started, and how it is today, starting tomorrow. Now, for those of you that might not be here tomorrow, I think we have some cross-country going tomorrow, right? You guys just need to get on the video and get the notes. How many people, how many people quickly are going to be gone Friday?